Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. It is our very good fortune to have uh, with us today a pioneer in descriptive complexity, uh, Neil Immerman. Uh, in fact, uh, Neil was the winner of the Gödel Prize for uh, resolving a very important conjecture related to descriptive complexity, or at least I understand the that's result it, came through it. descriptive mm -hmm. complexity. Yeah. And so he is going to give us a uh, survey today uh, on uh, descriptive complexity and some of the issues that he's currently dealing with. So thank you, Neil. Okay. So thank you very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And as Ken said, I'm going to give a survey of things I've been thinking about forever and, and some new directions and, and work other people have done in, in this area and what I think about it. And I, I really enjoy being interrupted with questions just, just to make sure you're connecting with what I'm saying. Otherwise, this can, can seem kind of abstract. So, so all questions are appreciated. So I'll try to give a survey about descriptive complexity and some new trends um, there's, there's something called dichotomy, which is a very interesting phenomenon that I'll talk about in, in complexity. Um, I'll talk about dynamic complexity. I'll talk just a tiny bit about SAT solvers and, and thoughts, which are going to be naive thoughts on my point of, of what I think about current software and, and how, how logic ought to, in my opinion, be able to help. And um, so that's. And all of this is a personal perspective, and you can take what I say with a grain of salt, or, or challenge me it will be more fun. And um, OK, so I hope, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so basically, I've been looking at this picture of the, of the world for quite a while. Um, so, so I just want to explain this diagram that, that you find on my web page all the time. And starting with polynomial time, which in this picture is this horizontal line, everything down. And polynomial time is the set of all properties. In complexity theory, um, as I'll talk about a little bit more, um, we look at, when you think of a computational problem, you have some input of a certain number of bits. n, n little n is always the size of my problem. Currently, n is somewhere between a, you know, a thousand and and a billion or some, you know, or maybe, maybe a trillion by now. And the size of the problem that we have to deal with, and, that, and everything else is, is a function of that. Now those, and then we, we're going to comp computing a sequence of bits. Each particular bit is a decision problem about the input. So if I want to know how hard this computational task is, I can reduce it to single bits. So everything is a decision problem. I want to know, given an input is the bit one, in which case the input has the property, or is the bit zero. OK, so those properties that can be checked by a computational device, uh, standard computer or a Turing machine, in some polynomial amount of time um, is called P. And it's a very nice, what I'd say, mathematical wrapper for all the truly feasible problems. So in this diagram, I have something undefined. And it's, it's, it's in dotted green. Just the things that are truly feasible, by which I mean that you can solve exactly on all the problems that you need to. So depending upon what n is for you, and if n is a million, you can solve all the problems of size a million in the size of computer that you can afford, whether you're an individual or whether you're Microsoft. It changes a little bit, but, but there it is. And in the time that you, you have to devote to it, which might be a second, it might be your lifetime. OK, so, the, so it's, a, it's not a very well precise defined thing, but the idea is that somehow, for some reasons having to do with dichotomy, as I've talked about before, those problems that those natural, naturally occurring sort of natural is not a well-defined term either. But let me just use it anyway, the way I'm thinking about it. Those naturally occurring problems that are, in fact, um, in polynomial time tend to be feasible. And this is a very, very interesting phenomenon. That's what makes sort of complexity theory and algorithms work. If you can get a nice algorithm in polynomial time, it's probably some people will improve it till it's almost linear or quadratic, depending upon, again, the size of your n. And you can actually get it into the feasible. So a lot of the work, in my opinion, in, 
in algorithms and complexity and so on, is taking a problem, defining it, maybe as you defined it, it was too abstract and it was way up there undecidable, or is here as NP-complete, and then maybe you simplify it or say, I'll take an approximate version of it and bring it into the feasible where you can really solve it. And, and I think of that as the process of algorithm development. And then lower bounds, I, may, I might prove something is, is hard. I might prove it's up there already complete. It's, it's undecidable. And yet some version of it, I can bring it down and actually solve it. OK, so I'll talk about this more as we go. Questions, even like the first question will help as we, as we go. Um, okay, so feel free. So, Can you push the dotted green line up a little bit for a few of us that are uh, <laughs> make our livings higher up in the? Uh, oh, oh, great! Center? So, so I was hoping for this question. So Ken says, what about all those, you know, those recursive problems that that we're trying to solve? And and my theory is, um, you think you're solving a recursive problem. Actually, actually, there's some subset of real problems that you're working on where the issue is, even though we don't know how to prove it yet, the issue is down here. So my feeling is if you're really doing it in your lifetime with the amount of hardware that Microsoft can buy for you, then it really is, is feasible in, in the way I'm thinking of it. Even though maybe it's only some of the problems that you can solve and you haven't identified yet which ones. Of course, in my lifetime, I only solve instances. So it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah. solve classes. Oh. OK, no, exactly. So there's that other issue that Ken mentions, that, that we only have finite things. So there's not really infinite. Why are we talking about infinite problems? And this comes down to just the modeling question. Why do we model our computer, which is really a finite state machine? Why do I model it as a Turing machine, which is unbounded memory? And it turns out that it, that, that turns out modeling as an infinite machine turns out to be a better model you can sort of understand your interest in how it's growing with the size, which is crucial to, to good algorithms. If you just thought of it as a finite state machine, you'd say, OK, there's only two to the, you know, two to the 100 billion states. I can list them all out. You can't list them all out. It's not a good model. So even though it's finite, I, imagining the infinite, I think, it improves our, our focus. Yuri? Right, to be a devil's Please, of course, as usual. <laughs> so, so one can say that. Um, all complexity theory suffers from being asymptotical. Yes. Now, the problem is if you... So Yuri says all complexity theory suffers from being asymptotical. Right. Or, so yes. if, if you don't make this assumption, then it's hard to develop any theory. Correct. But it would be interesting to see approaches. Because in, in every application, there is a certain range where instances occur. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That's where my N is, is I'm trying to imagine. As I say, depending upon the application, it might be a thousand, it might be right. a trillion. It's but in that range. One approach is, for example, you take log star of that range. Yes. And that number mm -hmm. may determine this range precisely, say, log star three. Oh, OK. Yes, yes, yes. So maybe we can develop. I'll, 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 oh, that's very interesting. This is, I mean, off topic, but let me just sort of answer. You could talk about, OK, you know, just so Yuri says, let's just look at n and put it into six possible categories. And do our complexity theory, depending upon which one we're in, it's very different depending upon which one you're in. That's a great idea. I'm sort of doing it more globally and saying, as if everything worked out nicely, which, which it doesn't. So that, that would be great. Um, yeah, let me, let me go on from that, but that's, that's a nice idea. Um, so, so yes, I mean, uh, right. So, I mean, we're doing this thing. We're proving that certain things are decidable, and we're really pleased, you know, even though we don't have an upper bound for the time, because then we hope more that since they're decidable, in fact, the ones we're looking at will be able to, you know, you'll get the answer on your machine before you go to lunch. You, you, know, you know, so it's, um, and it's part of this magic, just, just like polynomial time. Proving something is polynomial time doesn't do anything for me, because it might be time n to the 1 million. That's not any better than, than undecidable in some sense. But, but it's just this phenomenon that's not well understood yet, this, this, um, this sort of dichotomy phenomenon that says once it's in P, it's probably, it's probably usually kind of nice. Not even know the or not even know the polynomial. That would be, that would be horrible proof. I prove this is in polynomial time, but I don't even, I can't just, I know, I prove the exponent exists. I don't like that. I don't like that kind of proof. <laughs> I, I know. I know. I know. 
Okay, but they're not natural to me. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to mention non-intrinsic time because this is such an overblown concept now that I just want to, I, I do this with my students, just remind them that this is not a real thing. This is just a mathematical abstraction. So non-intrinsic time, the idea is you're starting in some state, and at each step you have, you have two choices. Or it could be more than two choices, but for simplicity, two choices. At each step I can do one of two things. I can do the zero choice or the one choice. At the second step I can do the zero choice or the one choice. So at each step there's a zero or a one telling me which choice I make. So if I'm running for time t of n, then by the end, if I'm not worried about memory, then there are exponentially many different choices I might have made. And then I'm doing a computation all along. I'll come to an answer, which again is it's just decision problems. So it's either a zero or a one. And for a non-terrestrial machine, we say the machine accepts if any of these exponentially pa many paths leads to a yes. Okay, then we say we accept. Fine. So, so we're searching an exponential space. That's an interesting, important concept. But the charging is, is, you know, is a real gimmick. I'm only going to charge you for the length of a single path. Okay, so the cost is t, the non intrinsic cost of this is t of n, even though the true deterministic cost, if we simulate it in a natural way, would be t of n times 2 to the t of n. So it would be exponential. So there's a big gap, or can be, between non intrinsic time and, and, and deterministic time. Deterministic time is real. We're living in, a, you know, in, our, in our world. And I, classically, you know, deterministic time is what we have. And we can talk about quantum a little bit, but not for a while. Um, so this is an interesting model. The reason it's important is that a lot of problems that we really would want to solve have this property, that there's an exponential search space. If you find the answer, you got it. But, but searching the exponential search space is very hard. So it's a, a very common, very important kind of, kind of process. I think actually phenomenally important, but it's still a mathematical fiction. You can't build a non-deterministic machine. Okay, so that's non-deterministic time. So then we get this um, this class, which it's sort of a one-sided class because notice that yes is different from no in non-deterministic time. So if you can find the answer, then the problem is an NP. And the complementary problem, if you can um, if you can prove that the answer is zero, then it would be in what's called co-NP. Those properties whose complements or an NP. So SAT, Boolean satisfiability, is, NP, is an NP, the complement, the things that are not satisfiable, is in co-NP. So there's this two-sided nature. So the class NP is this, um, this piece and everything below. And the class co-NP is that piece and everything below. And their intersection is called NP intersect co-NP. And it's a very, from a complexity theory point of view, it's an interesting class that we know very, very little about. NP intersect cone B, by the way, is where cryptography lives. So um, things that have unique, unique answers that you'd like to guess. So, so some people conjecture that NP intersect cone P equals P, which would mean at some level that you can't do cryptography. So kind of unlikely, I, I think. OK, so that's, that's our situation. And as I mentioned, many, many, many problems that we'd like to solve are in NP. And there's this really nice phenomenon that, that a lot of those natural problems we'd like to solve are, in fact, NP-complete. Every other problem in NP is reducible to them. Their hardest problems in NP, they're all equivalent. And it's a huge phenomenon of, of these kind of problems. And, and in a sort of overblown way, I kind of think that everything that you, so answer, coming back to Ken's question again, what about, what about way up there? Anything that you really want to devote your life to, I suggest, should be an NP. Because otherwise, even if you solve it, you can't even convince anybody that you've solved it. So the NP problems are the problems that once you've solved them, there's a, there's a clear readable proof that you've solved it. Okay. So somebody who's trying to do something bigger than NP is, is, is pretty quixotic. Because even if you do it, you know, how will you even convince anyone else? So I think, you know, so I think of NP as, as you know, what we're all going to, the, you know, the dreamers who are trying to solve problems. They should be an NP, in my opinion. And, and you can, you know. They should be an NP intersect cone NP, because I have to give the proof for both answers. If I have my set solver, I can give a polynomial size certificate that it's set. Oh. I can't give a polynomial size certificate that it's unset. 
Huh. OK, OK, so you want, so you want to be dense. So Ken says he wants to be down NP instead of cone P. Um, so it's not solving up. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't agree. I, I think you know, it's just, just each individual question is a question you're searching for that you've, for some reason, you have some insight. I think this formula is satisfiable. And you do the search, you know, and you come back after 10 years and say, ha ha, it is satisfiable. If, you try, if your search is in Cohen P, you're trying to prove it's not satisfiable. Uh, uh, <laughs> please, please. There are interactive proofs. Interactive proofs. Proof yes. Interactively, which works for both. Okay, okay. There are interactive proofs, and there's, I mean, there's all this complexity theories. I mean, you can look at interactive proofs repeated polynomial time, and that goes all the way up to classes we don't have here yet, like P space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but if you want to just publish a book, you know, no one can ask you questions because it's the end of your life. You publish a book on what you've done, and people can read it, you know, then it should be an NP. Okay, so that's, this is, I'm just speculating. So I mentioned this idea before that everything in computation, we have some input, it's n bits, and we have some output, it's polynomially many bits. And in complexity, we can just look at any particular bit and say yes or no. So we're focusing on decision problems. All, all complexity classes are decision problems. And that's no real restriction. I'm just focusing on each bit at a time that you're trying to compute. OK. And, and now I'm just here, I'm, I want to introduce the notion of descriptive complexity, which is <laughs> For me, been a very fruitful topic, and that's what I'm giving you the survey talk about. So we're just looking at decision problems. So we have some problem S. Does my input Qn through Qn satisfy S? And complexity says, how hard is it to check if the input satisfies S? How much time does it take? How much non-intrinsic time does it take? How much memory space does it take? How many processors working together does it take? That's traditional complexity. And and instead, in descriptive complexity, we say, well, how? That's a problem. That's a property. I can write it in some formal language if I have some logic training, and, and I like to go that way. How rich a language do I need to express S? It's a different kind of problem. That's the expressing or descript, describing, the descriptive complexity of the problem. And they, they sound completely different, right? How much time does the computer have to take to do it? How rich a logical language do I need to express it? Kind of different. Um, I'll, okay, great, great question. How do I measure richness? Um, I'll show you examples soon. It's just um, first order logic is very weak. Second order logic is richer. First order logic plus a mechanism to make inductive definitions is, is somewhere in the middle. So I measure in different ways how many variables I use, different, different notions of this, which I haven't defined yet. Okay. Good question. So that's the idea of descriptive complexity. And very surprisingly to me, and this is sort of the basis of my PhD thesis, and a, which is a long, long, long time ago, and a lot of things that have come since, is that, well, this is just another way. You know, there are all these models of computation, like Turing machine and lambda calculus and, and so on, that are all constructively equivalent. Well, in some sense, this is another. They really, it's really a way that you can view all of computation from this descriptive point of view. Rather surprising. And what I mean exactly there, unfortunately, I still don't exist. I don't have that expressed well enough. So don't challenge me too much on that. But, but it's something that I've found in my experience. It really is constructive. Um, so, so asking this gent gentleman's question, you know, looking a little bit more, I want to look at these languages a little bit. Computational problems, of course, I can always think of an input as a binary string, because every everyone in computer science is used to that. Um, I want to think of my input as a logical structure. So for most typical and nice, and the best way to model any problem at all, is a graph. So my input might be a graph like that G, which has some n vertices, and then it has a binary edge relation. So think of this as a directed graph. So, so the relation E holds between, between um, this point and this point, and we draw that as a directed edge between them. Okay, so that's a visual and a logical description of a graph. So that's my input, it's a graph. And that's nice for me because it's also a logical structure, so I have a natural first order logic to talk about it. And binary strings, if I want to think of a binary string like this binary string as a logical structure, I can. The most natural way is to say, OK, the elements of my universe. So, so, the, so a, a logical structure has a universe. Like up there, the graph, the universe is the vertices, and there's an edge predicate. And for a string, 
I think of the elements of the universe as the positions of the string. So this is a, um, a string with eight, eight um, bits. So th there are eight positions in the string. And I assume that I have access to the, to the normal usual ordering one to eight. So I know which bits come before the other bits. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a string. So I'm modeling a, this string is also this logical structure where I just have a unary predicate that tells me for each position whether it's a 0 or a 1. So here, this predicate is true of the second position, the fifth position, the seventh position, and the eighth position. So, so this string is equal to this logical structure. This drawn graph is equal to that, that logical structure. So my input can be a logical structure. I can now think of my input. I don't do anything. There's no work involved here. It's just conceptual. I'm thinking of my input as a logical structure. I can write logical properties about it. So, in general, for those of you, I suggested there might be applications to relational databases in, in descriptive complexity. So you can just think of any your relational database in some scheme as a universe of all the active things and then whatever relations you happen to have. That's what a relational database is. It's just a logical structure. So when we're doing database queries and looking at their complexity, we can think of it from this descriptive point of view. They ignore, they ignore order. In the relational database. Oh, right. I haven't to talked too much about I talked to you about, you already said they ignore order in relational databases, make, making for a really nice question. That's right. Now, in the string, I have to have the ordering. Otherwise, it's just a bag of bits. It's not a string. But for the graph, I don't have to have the ordering. right? But if you feed it into a computer, those vertices have to be in some order. So I'll talk about that soon. And, and relational database theory, very nicely, they try to ignore the order because they want the algorithm or the answer not to depend upon the internal ordering of the elements, which should be irrelevant. So they want, they want the queries to be all order independent. Bring up some really interesting questions. Thank you. Um, so then we have, the, obviously, you're very familiar, I assume, if you came to this talk with first order logic. Um, so depending upon what your vocabulary is, for graphs, for example, I can write first order formulas that quantify over the elements of the universe. So this formula alpha says for all vertices x and y, there's an edge from x to y. So every vertex has an edge coming out of it. That's a simple first order formula. This one, beta, formula about strings, says there's some position x, which is for all positions y, x is less than or equal to y. In other words, x is the first position in the string, and s of x holds. So beta says exactly this string starts with a 1. And this formula, well, I like to have some numeric symbols just to make my life easier. So as Yuri was saying, I want to think of my whole universe as ordered. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to simulate computation. You feed any object whatsoever into a computer, you find you've ordered it because you've given each point a binary name, the binary numbers are ordered. So you cannot input anything into a computer unordered. So there's no notion of a graph. In, in a computer. It's just an ordered graph. So, so for that reason, I, I'll always from now on have the ordering around. And a lot of the results I mentioned won't be true without the ordering for annoying reasons. Um, OK, so in particular, I have numeric symbols. I always have a quality. I always have the ordering on the universe. I have the, the first element, which I call min, the last element, which I call max. I might even have, since I have ordering on the universe, my input out, my universe is the elements 1 to n or 0 to n minus 1, depending upon how you want to look at it, we can have arithmetic on those numbers also. We can have those predicates, and I might want to talk about that for really weird, weird reasons that I'll mention later. So okay. are doing total order? Total order on the universe, why yes. Don't, why don't you like lattice or partial order? Because um, literally, so, um, so Tom says, why, why a total ordering? Why not a partial ordering? Again, because you give your graph to your computer, each vertex has a number, they really are totally ordered. So I, and, and what's more, some algorithms use that. They say, okay, I want to search this graph, I'll go to the first vertex out of, and I want to be able to simulate that in logic. So I find if I don't have that total ordering, I'm sort of holding both hands and both legs behind my back. And so I'm going to give it to you, but that makes logicians not Yuri, but most logicians, quite annoyed because now this is not classical logic anymore. It's very different. Okay. So just by the way, so this formula, if I have that min constant, then beta is more easily written as s of min. The first, the first bit is a 1. 
Okay? So there's three examples of first order properties. First order is sort of the lowest class, almost the lowest class I'm going to talk about today. Okay? Okay. Great. Questions are perfect. Coming really well right now. This is just the sort of the level I want to do. So, so now there's the stronger logic that I want to mention, which is second order logic. In second order logic, I can have variables not only talking about elements of the universe, but relations over elements of the universe. So unary relations, for example, would be subsets of the universe. Binary relations would be subsets of pairs and so on. So here's an example. Here's a graph, and there's a second order formula where I have those three new um, variables, second order variables, they're unary second order variables representing subsets of the vertices. So I'm saying there exists one subset of the vertices called red, one subset called green, one subset called blue, such that for all vertices x and y, each vertex is either red or green or blue, and for all pairs of vertices, if there happens to be an edge between them, they're not both red, they're not both green, and they're not both blue. So this formula, the second order formula, says exactly that this graph can be, can be vertex colored with three colors. Does that make sense? OK. So now I can quantify not only over elements of the universe, but relations over the universe. So second order is much stronger in first order. OK. So, there, so in particular, this formula says that I'm three colorable, which some of you might know is an NP-complete property. And something else about that formula is that it's, it's second order, but all the second order quantifiers are out front, and they're all existential. So that's what I would call second order existential. Okay. So Ron Fagan noticed this back in his PhD thesis. And he proved, in fact, ha, huh, this interesting class NP, this important class NP, has this very, very nice, elegant, machine-independent logical characterization. The NP properties are exactly the second order existential properties. And this is an example. Um, three colorabilities in NP, therefore it's second order existential. Every second order existential property is an NP. So exact characterization. Now, I was looking for a thesis topic. I was a grad student in 1975, when I started, or 76, I guess. Um, Ron's good friend and roommate, uh, Larry Carter, knew I was looking for a topic. And he sent me, he said, look at, look at this paper of Ron's. So I was really, I was really captivated by that, because that, that gave an amazing insight into this class that everyone was then trying to understand. This is the early 70s. People were trying to, they had these questions like, is P equal to NP? Of course it isn't, but people couldn't prove it. No one knew it was that hard, a question back then. And this seemed like a very nice way to try to, try to show, OK, um, maybe they're not. And that was the idea of Fagan's thesis, basically. But to prove, say, to prove P is not equal to NP, prove something's not an NP, you might want to show that something is not second order expressible, which is very hard. So I, I did some work on lower languages. I, I never go up to second order if I can avoid it, because it's too hard. So I'll talk about that in a minute. OK, does everyone understand Fagan's theorem? So that was the beginning of descriptive complexity, a completely logical characterization of an important complexity class. OK? Um, and so the, at the time, when I was writing my thesis, I thought first order was sort of just too weak to live. I, I didn't think it had any interesting properties. Uh huh. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Sure. Can you say a few words about how uh, these very different things, you know, one is complexity in terms of time, yes. and the other is something to do with these symbols. What is the intuition? Why are they connected? Great, the great. Thanks for the question. Tell me your name, by the way. My name is Shaz. Shaz. So Shaz says, huh, I just say this fact. That looks bizarre. How can these be equal? How, you know, what's going on? One's about non intrinsic time, one's about logic. OK, so let's, let's look at what a proof would look like that of Fagan's theorem, the NP equals secondary existential. First of all, let's do the easy direction. Every secondary existential property is in NP. OK, the way to see that, there's a secondary existential property. Um, there exists R1, G1, B1. And I want to build an NP machine to check whether that property holds or not. OK, so what am I given? I'm given an input graph. Uh, the input graph has n vertices. OK. And I want to know whether there exists R1, G1, and B1. Well, how many bits do I need to represent R1? For each of my n vertices, that vertex is either red or not. So I can guess n bits that characterize R1. OK. Then I can guess n bits that characterize G1. And I can guess n bits that characterize B1. 
that make sense? So I'll just non trivially write down three n bits, and now I have those three relations. And now I just have to check a first order property. Much easier. And, and a, that's easily done in polynomial time and less. So therefore, any second order existential property is checkable in NP. Does that make sense? Because really what, what this power is is guessing polynomially many bits. If it was unary, it's n bits. If it was binary, then for every pair of, of those n vertices, I have to guess a bit. So it'd be n squared bits. So this second order existential really just gives you, thank you for asking this question. This, this, I think this clarifies it. It's, it's, that you need cannot be larger than the size of the formula? Right. The so, the, no, so, for, so why is it only polynomial? Okay, any fixed formula. So, so what this means, I have a fixed formula, and that represents a decision problem. Some, some inputs, some graphs ha satisfy the formula, some do not. So every fixed formula is a decision problem. Every fixed formula has, it's just fixed like that, it has fixed relations of fixed arity. The maximum arity, call it k. So, so therefore, I only have to guess at most n to the k bits. To guess all the second order relations, then I have a first order property. OK, so it's very, important. it's very important that the formula is not part of the input. The formula is the fixed program or statement of the property. If the formula were part of the input, this would be much, much harder than NP. OK, fantastic. Does it make sense? And going the other way, well, let me just cheat and say, oh, look, I expressed an NP-complete property. Therefore, I can get all of NP. Okay. So I've already expressed an NP-complete property. So secondary existential is going to be powerful enough. That's, that's just, that's just a intuition, intuitively. I, can get, I got a hardest NP property. I can get, probably get all of them. That's not, that's not the way the proof went originally, but once you once you introduce notions such as first order reductions, you can translate all problems in a first order way and show that um, machines are closed into first order reductions and show that, in fact, three colorability is NP complete via first order reductions, then that would be a proof. I got a complete problem, I get all problems in NP. Does that answer your question now? Okay, so, that, so thank you for asking. So, that, so, that, so what's the relationship? Well, there is that relationship sitting there, even though it wasn't obvious at first. So these characterization theorems are not difficult. It's just the insight that you can understand things in this way that's useful. OK. So and then coming back, when I was originally thinking about this, I thought of first order, as I said, sort of too weak to live. Just I couldn't think you could write any interesting prop computational problems in first order. And then later I found out, oh, maybe you can. And one interesting one is, is addition. Addition is first order. So if, I've, if my input is too. Um, two binary strings, a, a and B. Okay, so, so I have, again, n positions. And now instead of one unary predicate, S, I have two. I have A and B. So I have two binary strings. And I want to know what their sum is. That might not look like a decision problem. But if I name any particular bit of the sum, I can say, what's that? That's a decision problem. How do I express that in first order logic? Okay. Well, how many of you know what carry lookahead addition is? That's what, that's what hardware uses, right? Okay, so it's, uh, so it's a practical notion. So basically, what's the carry into the ith bit? Well, there's a carry into the ith bit just if there's, there's a carry into the ith bit just if there's some point j to the right of i where the carry is um, generated. In other words, both of, both of the bits are one, a of j and b of j. And for all k between i and j, the carry is propagated. There's at least one one. That's when there's a carry into the ith bit. Class. I mean, I don't need quantifiers. I can just print the whole thing yeah. out. Okay, good, good. So Tom says I can do this with a Boolean circuit. What do you need a formula with quantifiers? The answer is, the answer is I have one fixed formula that does this for any size, any size input. Whereas that formula determines, in fact, if you can write out this formula in some sense, exists J. Okay, if you're writing a Boolean circuit, that J depends upon the size of the input. So this is really an n -ary, It's an n-ary OR gate. So I can think of this as a sequence of circuits. And I'll talk about that later. That, that would be a whole class. That's right. So, but the problem of addition itself, I can write with a single first order formula. So addition is first order. OK. So that's, there are some things that are first order. It's not, it's, it, it turns out it actually is an interesting class. So, th so then the sum is just, of course, A exclusive or B exclusive or C. And exclusive or I can write in terms of or and not. OK. So addition is first order. Um, and 
I only realized this much later, um, maybe like five years after my thesis. Um, and people were then talking a lot about parallel computation in this very abstract theoretical model, the so-called PRAM. And um, so I think Uzi Vishkin gave us this term, concurrent read, concurrent write, parallel random access machine, okay, which I just call CRAM. Okay, the, the idea is that you have, you have some number R, um, or maybe even N, a polynomial number of tiny equivalent processors. P1 through PR, you have some big but polynomial size global memory. And, and, and this is actually a synchronous model. So each of these little, um, you know, these, these are, you know, sort of processors that you can, you can put on 64 of them on a chip now. And um, each one has its little, you know, local registers, local memory. It can look in global memory. They're synchronous. And each step, each one can look at any particular bit of global memory. And it's concurrent reads, so they can all, a lot of them can read the same bit. Then they do a single computation. And then they can write to global memory also. And the write is also concurrent. So, so several processes could write into the same bit. So we have to say how to resolve that. And there are various ways to resolve it that are all more or less equivalent. One way is the priority write model. So if several processes write into the, into the same bit, the lowest number of processor that wrote succeeds. Another model is the so-called common write model, which is I will prove in my program that if, if at any time more than one processor writes into the same location at the same time, then they write the same thing. And that's annoying because you have this proof obligation, but I like the common write model because the common write model really comes corresponds to what a quantifier is. So let me just show you that. A quantifier is, is a sort of simple uh, parallel object. So assume that in my memory, I've already computed some array A of x, from, for x going from 1 to r. OK, so I have, that's, that's what I've computed so far. And now I'd like to compute, is it the case that for all x, A of x? Well, I can do that in one more step. OK, so basically, every will just write a 1 into a certain location, and processor i will just check a of i. If a of i is false, then it has learned, processor i has learned that for all x, a of x is false, so it'll write a 0 into that location. So one step later, if there are no counterexamples, then, then we know for all x, a of x. If there are any counterexamples, we know it's not true. So a quantifier is one, one step of a, of a cram with polynomial much hardware. Does that make sense? And obviously, an existential quantifier would be the same thing. We'd start with a 0, and anyone who finds the same answer writes it 1. And you see that this turns out to be the common right model, which is not that important. But make sense? So quantifiers are little parallel devices. And from this argument, you can see, in fact, um, first order logic is an interesting complexity class way down here at the bottom. It's the things we can do in constant parallel time. And so this would be cram time one. And there's also a model some of you may know about, otherwise don't worry about it, called um, a circuit model called AC0, sets of um, uniform polynomial size, unbounded fan and 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 or gates. Um, the whole circuit is polynomial size. It's the same thing as constant parallel time. And that sort of relates to, the, I think, the circuit that Tom was talking about. Okay. So first order is exactly constant parallel time. With, when you have polynomially much hardware. That seems like a kind of nice insight. Okay. And, and in fact, all of these things are the same. Basically, cram T of n, that's what you can probably you can, you can, you can check on a, um, on, a, on a cram, a polynomial. Um, parallel machine with polynomial much hardware in t of n parallel time. That's the same as what you can write in the first order inductive definition that closes in t of n steps. It's the same thing you can write if you take a basically a block of first order quantifiers and write them t of n time. It's a really weird form that I, I, I probably won't, don't have time to go into unless, unless anyone's really excited about it. But basically, if I take um, a block of quantifiers with this q1 is either for all or exists x1 such that m1, where m1 is a quantifier-free formula. If I just take this fixed block of quantifiers and literally write that same block t of n times, that's, that this model 
first order T of n. It's basically, so it's more than first order because I'm repeating this block of quantifiers T of n times. So T of n, and that's the same thing really that an inductive definition does if you repeat it T of n times. So first order iteration in that way, inductive definitions, is exactly parallel time. So that was kind of kind of interesting. Uh, the question about that? Okay. So, um, okay. So this, this is just that's what this theorem says. Basically, um, first order iteration is parallel time, and it works even beyond um, inductive definitions. Have this property that they have to close in polynomial steps, but iteration can go on beyond that. So a block of quantifiers. Which is, this is all it comes from the fact that a quantifier is a single parallel step on a cram. So, so time on a cram is just how many, how many quantifiers you're writing again and again. So, it's, so that's part of what I was saying in my abstract, that it turns out that, that natural properties and complexity, like space and time and parallel time, have natural, natural relations in, to, to how rich these descriptive languages are. OK, so where are we now? So we have a few more classes now. So there's first order is constant time. And if I iterate first order polynomially much, then of course I get polynomial time. The parallelism doesn't matter anymore. And this is characterized, a least fixed point, probably most of you know, is a way, a logical way of characterizing inductive definitions. I can define new relations by induction. And first order plus least fixed point characterizes that. So this tells us that polynomial time is exactly first order plus least fixed point. Point, first order plus inductive definitions, or first order iterated polynomially. Uh, this is all, thank you, this is all with ordering. Okay, so if you give me a graph, you, you give me a graph, say, uh, and you don't give me ordering, and say that graph is not very helpful, maybe there are no edges. So you give me n points with no ordering. For the first order formula, there's no structure whatsoever. So if you only give me a constant number of variables, as in all these settings, there's only a constant number of variables, even if they're iterated, then the poor first order formula, even iterated as many times as you want, can't, it say it only has three variables, it only, can only count up to three. So if you want to know, is there an even number, an odd number of vertices there, this poor formula, even this poor formula, can't tell you without the ordering. So without the ordering, you're, there's a certain kind of strange restriction. And so, so, so I'm just assuming under the covers that my languages always have the ordering. Okay, thanks for the question. Okay, otherwise these, these characterizations would not, would not hold, they'd, they'd just be subsets. Okay, and, and by the way, if you take a first order formula and iterate it to death as many times as you want, the most times it's useful to iterate is exponentially many, and that gives you polynomial space. Where you can think of what's polynomial space, that's a, I just have polynomially many memory locations, and I can run as long as I want, which is in the limit. The most I could ever want to run is exponential time. So that gives you, um, that gives you polynomial space. So, so I knew all of this in my thesis already, and I was just kind of thrilled by that. And I still sort of am, even though. Um, so the idea is you take a fixed block of quantifiers, and you iterate it, um, you iterate it polynomially, you, you, you characterize polynomial time. You iterate it exponentially, you're all the way up to polynomial space. So, question? Uh -huh. It's sort of things about matrix of things above P space. So, 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 so data log uh, query when you So, da so well, data log. I'm sorry, uh, program. So, okay, okay, great. So, if you look at prolog, prolog sort of was so called logic programming, but then a few little things got added such as in, in Prolog you can construct new objects so you can increase your memory without bound and then you become essentially Turing complete. Okay, so, so if you think of data log, data log where you don't have constructors, data log is polynomial time. Prolog is, is way up at the Turing machine. So do you have another, I can talk to you more offline about that but maybe no, it, it just seems that this characterization is missing something that you get uh, with data log. So okay, so you say, oh, what, what is missing when you get with data log? So, so data log, you can add, if you think about my data structure, data log can add another element to the data structure. 
So I have my input graph at size n. Now I can add one. So now it's n plus one. I can add one as n plus two. I can just keep doing that so I can have basically unbounded memory, unbounded size. So, so not, not data log, but prolog. Yeah, prolog lets me. Data log intersection first of the logic is almost empty. Right. So it is sort of very, it's an alternative way to see things. Okay, do you mean data log or prolog? Uh, data, data, data log, not prolog. Well, I think of data log is, so my, my understanding of data log is probably theoretical no. to theoretical. Okay, so, so, so I can encode QSAT or QBF in data log in a simple way. I cannot encode uh, uh, data log with QSAT. Um, oh, okay, so, so tell me your name again. Nikolai. So, oh, sorry, Nikolai. So Nikolai is saying, um, so hi, I hadn't met you before. Uh, so he's saying that he can encode um, in data log. So, it's, so let me talk to you offline because so the version of data log that I'm thinking about, maybe it's a, it's a, maybe it's a theoretical version. The version of data log I'm thinking about is just exactly for sort of plus least fixed point. But so Space and printing, maybe that's a um, future slide in the talk. It's well, well, there'll be there'll be more stuff. Yeah, there'll be more stuff up in there. But my my understanding of data log is down is down here. And let's talk offline and see okay. what see what you have that I don't have. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, I would. Uh, when logic was first. Invented by people. By Aristotle, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. There were no computers around. There were no computers around, indeed. So they were driven by very different motivations. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So what I'm wondering now is, what is it that makes a logic a logic? I mean, in our drive uh -huh. to characterize various notions of computation right. by logics, uh -huh. I'm sure that we can always make up some logic or the other that looks like it, but you know, I mean, it's just, you know, you can give it whatever meaning you want, it's a collection of symbols. Okay, okay, so okay, okay. I'm okay. trying to get at here. Okay, okay, so, uh, Ayaz, right? Huh? Your name was Ayaz? Shaz. Shaz, I'm sorry, but I'm ter really terrible with names, I apologize. So Shaz says, um, so what, what's going on, what, what, what's really a logic? I'm, I'm sort of talking about the logics that, you know, that Tarski invented that, you know, basically to model the process of doing mathematics, which turns out, turns out to be very relevant for modeling computers. So, so yes, you can bend the logic and change it. Um, for, me, for me, because these are classical things that I understand extremely well, and they exactly characterize these things, I'm excited about it. But, um, right, since then, there have been many, many other characterizations and many, many bends and twists until it's hard to keep track. So these are all sort of classical logics. The only difference is that I have ordering. So all these logics were in, they predate computers. Of course, essentially. except for the ordering. So I'm, I'm insisting that I have an ordering on the universe. Okay. And the other thing, standardly in logic, um, all interesting questions are about infinite structures. Finite structures are considered trivial. But in this setting, my input is my structure, so it's finite. So, so this is part of, also part of something called finite model theory, where, where we're asking different questions that turn out to be more combinatorial. Uh -huh. First, they have computer. In full oh, ancient time. Yeah. <laughs> ruler, okay. Ruler and okay. compass. It was a real computer. Okay, let's, uh, let, let's, let's, <laughs> wait, 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 let's no. because uh, logic in general, it's um, art of deduction. But class, logic work, it was interesting, it's very objective. During the great crisis of mathematics 100 years ago, logic was used to solve it. And that time, certain classical logic appeared, which became a golden star. Mm -hmm. In particular, first of all. So it is, it is not some kind of one of logics. It is the logic. Mm -hmm. But data log is almost disjoint, mm -hmm. pure recursion. So it, it, Nikola had point there. So okay, okay. <laughs> so thank you. So anyway, um, yeah, as you said, I mean, there are now a gazillion logics lying around. Um, and I was talking about sort of standard things. And just for me, what was amazing is, okay, these computational problems I'm trying to understand, in fact, are identical to 
classical standard logical concepts. Basically, um, basically parallel time is just the iteration of quantifiers. Another re really interesting thing for me is that the, uh, the size of the problem I'm dealing with, the amount of hardware I have, relates to just how many, how many variables I have in my logic. So, so going out this way, the size gets bigger and bigger. I have more and more variables. Sort of one, sort of one strange thing, um, um, maybe, maybe I, I just sh I shouldn't go there. Let me, let me go on a little bit. I was, I was thinking, so, so I was thinking I wanted to give an hour talk because so, everybody has a lot to do. So I would like to sort of get to conclusions pretty quickly. Let me, let me go a little bit and talk about a few other things. Um, two things I won't, there have been a bunch of really exciting breakthroughs that I can't necessarily tell you about. They're sort of complexly theoretic. One is really great. Ben Rossman has proved some really nice bounds about how many variables you need to express properties in first order logic plus ordering. First order, once you can put ordering on first order logic, it's very hard to prove lower bounds. And for a long time, we didn't know how to do this. And Ben, ben showed, OK, if you, just if you want to talk about a, a clique, I want have a clique of size k. Obviously, you can write that in a first order formula with k variables. There exists x1, x2, to xk, and all edges are connected. And we want, want to, to, without ordering, it's very easy to show that you need those k variables. With ordering, that was very hard. And it hadn't been known for 25 years or so that you needed more than three variables to say, to say k clique. And Ben showed basically you do need at least k over four variables. Um, and so this is a really lovely breakthrough. And, and there's another kind of amazing thing that Martin Groey has shown, which relates to stuff that Yuri and I have looked at about trying to characterize um, properties without ordering. So if you look at, if you look at first order plus least fixed point, as I think Nick, Nick Gly asked about, without ordering, I can't even count. So if I add counting, then I can get first order plus least fixed point plus counting. It's a really interesting class. Um, and I proved with some people, uh, Ginny Tsai and Martin Fuhrer, that still it's not enough to get all polynomial time properties. However, what's really interesting is if you compare two graphs with first order logic k variables and counting, so it's a polynomial time check, um, that sort of includes most interesting graph isomorphism questions. So in fact, what Martin Groy showed is that for, for many, many classes of graphs, every class of graphs um, that define having excluded minors, whatever that is, let me get into it, um, k var first order plus least fixed point and counting suffices to characterize computation on that class of graphs. So, it's, um, so it turns out that that language without ordering is already extremely interesting combinatorially. And this is, a, this is gorgeous work, which I don't, I mean, maybe one question if you want, but I, I, don't, I don't have too much time to do that. OK, that's, that's sort of the theoretical side. Here's um, a sort of more complete picture where beyond p space, yes, there's exponential time and many, many other classes. But again, for me, I really am trying to get down here. I'm thinking of, OK, NP is really what I'm aiming for, and when I can pull it down into polynomial time, I'm very happy. Um, let me talk about dichotomy a little bit, because I think it's the last thing I have time to talk about before the end questions. And I th this is a fairly interesting phenomenon also. So basically, I was saying this before, if you take natural problems, so if you're teaching an algorithms course, you talk about the problems you run into, computational problems, they tend to be complete for, for one of my favorite, five favorite complexity classes almost all the time. And it's, it's a really funny phenomenon. Um, and this phenomenon has, was first pointed out by Schaefer, who looked at a large class of satisfiability problems and showed that each one of them was either NP-complete or is in polynomial time. So, so that's the dichotomy. There's some things that are NP-complete, there's some things that are polynomial time, and nothing in between. That's why he called it a dichotomy. Whereas Ladner had proved that, well, if P is different from NP, then there's a dense hierarchy between them. So all these problems exist, but in, they, don't, they don't represent themselves in terms of satisfiability problems. And p since then, people have found a whole lot of dichotomy problems where certain classes of, of ways of expressing properties 
have this dichotomy, they don't get the weird, kinky, complicated problems. They only get the nice, complete problems. Okay. So you can, you, can, you can extend Schaeffer's dichotomy and say each of these problems is either NP-complete, or it's P-complete, or it's non intrinsic log space complete, or it's log space complete, or it's complete for um, basically, um, what's it called? Um, um, first order plus some mod, mod P. Uh, or if he's base two, some mod two. Um, so, so what it means is that the problems we run into, the problems we really need to solve, are from a much smaller class, really, than, than what we think. And, and this is, in sense, and this is why algorithms work. You, you figure out an algorithm like graph reachability or vertex coloring, and you spend a lot of effort optimizing it, and then it comes up all over the place. And the, sort of the, so understanding why the dichotomy occurs in certain strong formalisms like constraint satisfaction problem is, re is really interesting work going on. And it seems like, in some sense, that there's the progress that has come from this has been used like 100 years of universal algebra. Results from there have really paid off in understanding the CSP problem. Why there are few, few algorithms? How they Uh, would, dichotomy means that, that the problem you want to solve is also a problem that I want to solve and a lot of other people want to solve that we've already worked on a very good algorithm for. If every problem was completely different, a different place in the hierarchy, then, then it would be a lot less useful to spend 10 years getting the best algorithm. But the naturality which manifests itself in different ways. Yes, yes. So that's, that's just a phenomenon that's, that's kind of amazing. And it comes up, I think, for me, oh, I wanted to talk about dynamic complexity. And I, I just don't have time. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, there's uh, all the things you really wanted to hear. But let me just get to a punchline here, which was SAT solvers, OK? which. Um, originally, you know, 1971, Cook proves SAT is NP-complete. That was evidence that SAT is hard. It was the first NP-complete prop property. And then Karp showed, oh, a lot of other problems are actually exact, that we want to solve are exactly equivalent to, to SAT. And, and since then, there have been incredible progress in SAT solvers and SMT solvers and so on. And, and of course, every problem you want to solve, if it's an NP, and my claim is every problem you want to solve as an NP, is reducible to SAT via simple reduction, which means that now these excellent SAT solvers that, that, that people have wonderfully built are general, general purpose problem solvers. So it's a very funny phenomenon. There's still hard cases. There are hard instances of SAT that SAT solvers can't solve in a feasible amount of time. But ones that turn up in practice, um, for some reason that we don't understand again, tend to be, and there's a lot of work in you know, which classes are easy, which classes are hard, a lot of work in proof complexity. We have a general purpose solver now. So this is unbelievable. And it's very useful. And it's being used all over the place here in, um, in, um, in basically checking programs, synthesizing programs. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts about why that should be. And it's just a very funny phenomenon now. So what's hard, what's not hard, is really subtle. It has to do with what problems occur in understanding that better. And, and um, so I'm just really, I'm sort of amazed that now on, on my machine, I have a general purpose problem solver that's s much smarter than me in terms of thinking of examples. I say, is there an example of this? I just ask, and there it is or not. Very, very useful. Um, useful for a lot of different reasons. Um, can I say two? Um, OK. So I want you to talk about um, um, software. And you know, I, I, I mean, obviously, you guys and a lot of people in many places are producing wonderful, fantastic software, doing amazing things, such as telling me how to get between between um, the apartment I'm <laughs> Take a great good to see you, Jerry. Thank uh, um, my apartment and, and building 99 here. Um, 
there's a lot of amazing software out there. And it controls more and more of our lives. And I'm finding that, you know, just in some sense, everything you do is computer related. And just I had a day where I, uh, you know, very recently, I'm sure you've all had this, where you go in, you go to, I went to an optometrist, and the, um, and the optician and I waited while the computer found something. We were just both sitting there, you know, twiddling our thumbs, waiting for the computer. You know, 20 years ago, she could have done something instantaneously, you know, by taking, doing it on paper. Now she can't do it anymore. And she has waiting for this computer, which was just, you know, she just said, I don't know what's the matter with her computer, but, you know, and then, then I went to pay my bill, and the same problem, it, you know, I don't know if, you know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't take my money, you know, you know and because there's something wrong with the computer, you know, it's just sort of, so in one level, fantastic. This really fantastic software is getting better and better. At another level, um, there's, there are basic problems that are, you know, they really are out there and we should face them. So, it's, so this is what I say. Software in general, even though it's fantastic, is also buggy, insecure, brittle, hard to change. It's not, it's not an adaptive, as adaptive as kind human beings when you go for help. You know, it's, you, 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 if you, so, so very often I'm in a situation where I say to the, my phone, can I please speak with a human being? <laughs> you know, after a while it lets me. You, you know, and then some of the human beings are helpful and some of them are not. But um, anyway, okay, th there's this, there is a problem. I think it's getting worse in the sense that software is more and more important in everybody's lives. So, and now we have these general purpose problem solvers. We have logic, which is tightly tied to, to computer science. So there really is this amazing progress that Ken and Mulino did and many, many of you and are doing with the help of Nikolai um, to, to automatically check the programs are doing what they're supposed to do. And even, you know, we've looked a little bit naively, and a lot of you have done more, on synthesizing correct code. You know, write the specification, synthesize code that's good. So this, this idea of being robust, understanding, I want the machine to understand at some level what it's doing. Understand well enough not to do something really stupid, not to be really brittle, but to say, you know, I want the computer to say, no one's ever asked me that before. I don't know. I will ask my um, creators, you know, and, and go and ask that question, you know, or get better. Okay. And I think logic can help. That's, so that's, that's sort of what I wanted to say. I'm sorry if this is kind of disjointed. And uh -huh. I have a question about the previous slide. Sure. To go sure. one slide back. Absolutely. So now we have this universal solver on our computer. Yes. So once I've shown that, that, that the problem I'm interested in is an NP, yes. should I even bother trying to establish whether it's an NP, trying to find a provably linear time algorithm, or should I just use my uh, uh, okay, okay, great. So, so, great question. Once the problem is an NP, can't, can't um, Z3 just solve it? And the answer is um, only on simple instances somehow. So, it can solve it sometimes. So, yeah, you know it's an NP, run Z3 on it, please. And if it solves it, you know, just go to the bank and, and be happy. If it doesn't solve it, then you have to look farther. Because there are these sets of instances of SAT that, that the SAT solvers can't do. I have, there's a survey paper actually by um, Jakob Nordstrom, who's an expert in, in, um, in proof complexity, about when, when SAT's hard for SAT solvers and when it's not. It's a really interesting survey article, it's, which is sitting off my web page. It's, um, uh, which I, you, know, you can look at it, I can send it to you. Um, so the answer is, yeah, once you know it's an NP, you can try the SAT solver, and you might be lucky, fantastic. But it, but it, it doesn't solve all SAT instances. But I would not know if I'm lucky or not, because I Until can you try, to. try a few instances right. that exist in my hand, and I can try that, and I can make a guesstimate. Right. And then I give my supposed solution to my user, and God knows what uh, instance he's going to try at it. 
That's right. So, I'm sort of so we need a lot more theory. Me. So you need to look much more closely at your problem and understand where it is. Maybe it's in a class that Z3 can do great all the time. Maybe it's in a class, one of the classes that Nordstrom identified that forget it. And maybe it's somewhere in the middle where we don't know. So there's this kind of question now. So there's, there's a wonderful quote. Christos Papinicio wrote a very nice book on complexity theory. Um, and, um, and one of the things he wrote on the NP chapter is he said, proving that a problem is NP complete is the first thing we should do, not the last thing we should do in analyzing it. Once you know it's NP complete, you have to look a lot more deeply. Uh -huh. Can you go to the next slide? Absolutely. So the other big trend, uh, if you all of uh -huh. the other the other big trend in sort of the I mean maybe it's the the battle of the twenty first century is you know maybe it's not logic and binary decisions maybe it's machine learning and what is the logic that's in our brains and why are we adaptable and maybe you're maybe this is completely wrong headed I mean maybe this is actually the worst possible way for us to be going about, you know, uh, getting uh, good software. I mean, maybe we should be having learning algorithms, and maybe we should be understanding our brain and what the logical hierarchy is there. So I, I don't really know. I, uh, great, great. I'm, sure so, it's our, I'm not sure it's our best hope, actually. Uh, we're buying cars now that will, will stay in their lanes, and they're all trained by neural nets and you know, uh, the, evidence, they really do. You know, the evidence the evidence is, is pretty much so far that they're as good as humans. So Okay, so, so fant fantastic question. So so there's um probably so machine, better actually. What? Probably they're better than humans. Machine already. well, they're better for, than for humans in a way. at some things. You know, and as I mentioned, you know, Google Maps is better than me for finding my way here. You know, no question. And but there's um, so machine learning is, is very hot and it's very good at doing certain kinds of things in, and certain things including you know some language recognition and staying in lanes is I mean there's a whole bunch of other things that are available that are not available to people um, then um, so yes I mean maybe there's a way that machine learning can help us do a little better with certain or do a lot better with certain pieces of this other pieces I think to get the software actually right, and I, I would like it not only right, I would like it secure. Um, so then I think I, well, I mean, machine learning can look for patterns of attacks again. So it's, it's certainly a tool. So why am I concentrating on logic? Um, in some sense, I, I have, I have well, well, you know why I like logic, but I have this sense that, um, that we, can, we can totally characterize what we're supposed to do. If, we're, if we were willing to be a little bit more formal and willing to use the tools that we now have, we can, I think we can make a huge amount of progress. But, but this idea, I think it's not only making them you know, greater, greater, better, better, faster, faster, but also getting them to sort of understand what they're doing so that they can, they can be verifiable and not have all these bugs that people can go in and... The interesting and, intersection uh, is, and maybe Shell's, I'm stepping on you, sorry, is that when you say controlling more and more of our lives, actually a big part of that is cyber-physical. So the drones yes. flying, the cars driving, Ooh, yeah, and yeah. there you're in continuous uh, real world where the computers and the algorithms uh, are, are dealing with, uh, you know, many, many more distinctions, let's say. And it's oh, not just a... So that's interesting. So, so that's just... Anymore. So I, I have a comment about so, Tom's observation. Go, go. Tom, you gave the example of automatic cars, and you gave the example of maps. And somehow the um, implication so, so, well, uh, implicit uh, uh, in your comments is that it was machine learning that pulled us off. But I would argue that if you look at the contribution of machine learning, as opposed to all sorts of classical systems engineering, control theory that goes into making a scenario okay. like that possible. Possibly machine learning is the icing on the cake. Okay. But uh -huh. and I think I think the reason yeah. there's this perception that machine learning is controlling everything is because it's the current you know <laughs> phrase sure. sure. I think enough. all these things require a tremendous amount of classical engineering and classical sure. knowledge that has accumulated over decades. I, 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 I totally agree with that. Machine yeah. learning is also classical, it's just optimization. It's all machine learning is it's, optimization. You're, but it's you're a certain denials to, to yeah. optimize the amount sure. of error. And, yeah. and, and, but know. it's very hot technique right now. But, but you know, I absolutely agree. There's a huge amount of 
But there's also some synergies there. I mean, uh, Eric Harvins came, Dustin chatted about, you know, I mean, people are concerned about, you know, what, what are these algorithms that people are synthesizing using machine learning doing and controlling and, and can you verify or at, at least, you know, um, monitor them in a way that indeed, you, indeed. you can guarantee that they, they stay within some envelope. Right? Indeed. So, so, so right, you look at cars that you can now hack into and, and control, if you think about that, that's, you know, that's people getting the cart before the horse, if you will, and not, and not checking that the different modules in the car that are talking to each other are, are safe. I mean, there's, there are conditions that can be checked. Well, you know, yeah, that right. need but, to be checked. Yeah, I mean, there's so many social things going on there. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you have to understand the people who build the car, they buy from a supplier a radio. Right. They have no idea what software is in the radio. Right. They don't recognize that someone can attack that radio by plugging in a CD, which can then cause it to go on the CAN bus and talk <laughs> to the braking subsystem. And right, 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 right. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we haven't yet reached the point where we even know what are in our engineered systems, you know, much, much less that, that, you know, we could prove something about them at a level that would make them secure and not deny right. that way. There's, a, there's sort of a long way to get j just to the point where you could say, apply Z3 to help make that car more secure. We have a, we have a long way, uh, a long way to go. Right, right. But, um, it's, it's really true. Yeah. It, the two other comments I wanted to make. One was about, because machine learning was interesting to bring up. You know, there is this idea of machine learning also. You, know, you have a hypothesis space which is defined by a language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And you have a notion of complexity of learning a concept yeah. within that mm -hmm. hypothesis space. In other words, how many, for example, how much data or how many examples right. does it take to distinguish a, a concept? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. is, is there a connection between learning theory and, and uh, descriptive complexity? Um, that's a great question. I, did, I didn't know. I mean, I mean there's, um, there's, I mean, there's somebody at Berkeley now who's, who's looking at basically first order logic plus probability to deal with um, sort of to try to join those two worlds. Um, um, Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Russell is what I'm thinking about. Um, so he just had an article last month in CICM about that, yeah. Um, so the, but I don't, I don't, it's, I'm not an expert on, on that area. It's, no, there ought to be, for sure, for sure. And connecting logic and probability, of course, really right. So my other comment has to do with you know, this characterization of, of, of P being the practical. Thanks a lot. The practical problems. You know, yes. P is for practical. He is a, a mathematical wrapper for practical problems. But I wouldn't say that P stands for practical. I would say P stands <laughs> for predictable. Right? In other words, ah. if I know the problem is P, I can calculate in advance so, right, so he is guaranteed how long the running right, time will right. Will, it's guaranteed feasible, right? right Whereas right. you know, for NP, I don't, I don't have that. And right. So SAT solvers have this long tail, right? Of, of course, of yeah, yeah. Times. They may do well on on average for the class of problems I want to solve, right? But they're not predictable. And right. I can very right. easily make a tiny change in the input that doesn't seem to matter to me, and the SAT solver takes much longer right. to, to right. solve the problem. So it has this aspect aspect of not being predictable which is rather like when you went to the dentist or the opt optometrist uh -huh. or whatever it was, uh -huh. how long is it going to take to settle your bill right. using the computer? On average, very short, <laughs> but the tail is long. Right? And I think that, that when you say brittle, uh -huh. brittle actually maybe means long tail. Right? Huh. In other words, the, the amount of time that it takes me to solve the problem goes ranges from zero to infinity in an unpredictable way, oh, even though the average is small. Interesting. Right? So for me, me what, I was, that's very interesting. what I was thinking about Brittle is sort of, um, you know, software is designed for, typically for things that the designers have anticipated. And when something comes along that the designers have not anticipated, it's usually not adaptive. Yeah, that's, not that's, yeah. Right. I can yeah. look at my input and predict what the system's going to do. Right. Right, right, right. right. If it were predictable, I would be happy. Right? Of course. Predictable of course. could mean runtime, or it could mean something about the output. Output right, right, right. has some nice, some pleasantness property, mm -hmm. you know, that I, yeah. that I, that but, I wanted but, to have. But your version of unpredictable, how long the SAT solver will take, I think is, um, it's very interesting. It's a little different. It's, it's a question of how much we don't know about, about characterizing this problem. Yes, it's NP complete. That means that there's a, there's a certain core that's NP complete, but, but where do the problems we really want to solve live between this? It's hard to know. 
you never are going to have that. You're never going to have the ability to say, this is a subclass of these problems that I want to solve that I can get predictable performance out of the SAT solver from. Right. The SAT solver is a highly complex object. Of course. The behavior is a very complex object. Of course. Object. I am not able to predict, looking at the input, how it's going to behave. Right. And right. That's, just, that's the difference between the SAT solver and you know, so any polynomial algorithm. Right, where okay, I can very okay. easily look at my input. All I have to do is count the size of the input, and I can say something very strong about how that thing exactly, is going to be Exactly, exactly. Right? Which is never going to be true for a SAT. So that you're, the, the reason that... Well, well, there's subclasses of SAT that are guaranteed will be fast. But once, once you know you're in that subset, you could run a, a different, more predictable algorithm, yeah, as you say. Then I'd be in a different problem, right? That's right, that's right, I, wouldn't that's be using, I wouldn't be using a SAT solver. So if it was right, you're two, only two, using the SAT solver. If it were 2CNF or something like sure. that, I wouldn't that's, be using it. That's right. Using that's right. Solver. So, so my point is that the reason that some of those, some of the practical problems mm -hmm. live outside of P, mm -hmm. outside of predictable, mm -hmm. right, is that we're willing to live with unpredictability. Mm -hmm. We're willing to live with the fact that sometimes we go to the optometrist and it takes 20 minutes to pay the bill right, right. because there's some kind of software problem sure, because sure. there's a very complex system whose behavior I'm not able to correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. And and so that and so to the extent that we can live with that, then those problems are right, that we can live with the long tail. Mm -hmm. Then those problems are are practical. Right? And that that's really the fun. That's function of our tolerance. You know, that's that's our function of our tolerance for uncertainty. Uh -huh. As opposed to anything particular about the problem space. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, see, I had this feeling. Maybe it's just maybe it's just naive that that there are design methods for software, including um, you know specifying what your module is going to do and, and checking that 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 um, that fits in correctly with the other module that would make things so more so resilient. Can, right, so doing this, I can, I can buy some predictability in the behavior of that module by proving a property of it, mm -hmm. like that it doesn't crash, let's right. say. Mm -hmm. okay, so I can buy some predictability. Right? In order to do that, I have to pay someone. I have to pay Nikolai or right. somebody right, 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 to, right, use right. The, to use this very flaky, unpredictable <laughs> tool in order to prove that. So I'm really pushing the brittleness around uh -huh. by, by, by doing that. Interesting. 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 I mean, so I'm I'm paying so that you don't have to pay. I'm paying in advance. Right, 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 right. right. But I, yeah, I mean, to me, you know, again, uh, he's gone. But I mean, there could be, you, you know, people have talked and people are talking more about how we, you know, can we build engineering standards that require require software to be secure? And people build software and say, of course not. There's no way to do that. But um, but I, I think as as these some of the or tools get more um, more whatever you know more ready for the real world, they they you know could have to be used. And so so Microsoft requires certain tools to be used in, in building software. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yeah. um, and you know these tools can be improved to a certain point that that things would be. Better, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean the the big problem we have generally is that is that people people don't do formal designs and they jump into uh, very complex, very complex programming language right. where we get many low level details. And what's been happening more recently, like mm -hmm. in the last ten years, is like people using higher level domain specific languages right. Right. Uh, or using or doing some modeling. TLA and, mm -hmm. and, and at least they're carving out smaller algorithms. They're still complex, but mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to what we did with you know SLAM and Static Driver Verifier, was you just give us all your C code right. and we'll try to extract some sense from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I think part of it is part of it is is really also saying, well, what is software and how do we get you know how do we get to to the software from some higher level where where we have we have more hope for these things mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. because we've done some careful design and in a way that makes makes more uh, again it's hard to say is it tractable or not we just know it's simpler in some sense there's less detail so it's easier but but I think it's you know again it's about having the human 
supported by the machine at the right level of abstraction. Mm -hmm, right, There's right. some logic there for there that. Is, is, I mean, I, I think the classic example is sort of SQL with the relational algebra, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, which gives you all this beautiful algebraic properties and query optimization. And, right, right, right. Exactly. We don't have a lot of other great examples like that, unfortunately. Right, right. So that's I mean, a, we have communicating finite state machines, and Shaw's has worked on the language uh -huh. for having them communicate, mm -hmm. but concurrent state machines are already like if you just have more than a handful or even a handful, you're already in a very bad spot. So you have to, you know, carve out your state machines and then do modeling right. Right, right, of right. the environment. So, um, so I think also we have to sort of think about what we mean by software. Um, uh, and a lot of the progress maybe I think we'll make is is maybe with some higher level signs or things like IV, where you you have a. a, a the description. Right. So, so there's some hope, description. right, that says that, you know, if you can force yourself, you need to squeeze yourself into a certain box, right, and say, I'm going to use languages of, of very restricted power. Yeah. Right, so that all my questions become easier. Yes. You know, and then the question becomes, how hard is it to get the problem I want to solve, you know, into that restricted right. language, exactly. from which point I can get the machine to do something for me. Exactly. Reliably. So, I think that's sort of, that's yeah. a hope. Right? That's, that's uh, a hope, but, right. but, the, but, but, but you're immediately going to cast out many people who will not, right. who want to write some English and then say, ah, oh, yes, now I know how to implement right. it. Right, right. And so there's, is, it's going to be more specialized. Right, so this is a cultural thing too. Yeah. This part of, again, the description of complexity, you can see the complexity on its face. So you could, you could say, okay, I'm only going to write in this language. And the question is, how, how annoying does it have to be? How annoying is it to get into that language? Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. right, right. Right. And um, and it, again, it's a question. Build, I think maybe perhaps building flexible tools. I mean, so first of all, you know, your standard programmer is not going to want to have to deal with that. You're going to have to make it nice yeah. for them. Well, this is right. So this is what I was saying about you know paying now or paying later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People always want to pay later. Of course, right? because especially because we're, we, you know, we live in a marketplace. Yeah. Right. And for the thing to be successful, it has to happen at exactly the right time. So right. it really doesn't work. Too late doesn't work. Your timing has to be perfect. Yeah. Right. So you can't pay in advance for this brittleness. Right. right? You can't right. say I'm going to subject this thing to formal analysis that's going to have a very long tail. It's going to be a very long tail distribution. Yeah. Right. Because you, you have, have to get to it to have, market. You have yeah. to, the, the thing you most need the predictability for mm -hmm. is not the correctness of the runtime. Mm -hmm. It's time to market. Mm -hmm. right? Right. 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 And so that means that you're going to pay the brittleness problem later yeah. rather than earlier. And it explains the architecture of the World Wide Web and many other things right. that you might look at and say, my god, how could anyone think and design something like that? Right. Right. But right. You know, the answer is those people were working under constraints of course. In, in which you know questions about security and correctness were sort of secondary Wait, and tertiary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and right. so if if the market's going to decide that what the most important thing is is predictable time to market, right? Right. Then maybe some of these issues about complexity are going to mean that we never get secure systems. Right. Right. You have to change. Right. You have to change that economic and social structure mm -hmm. in order to get the incentive to people actually have to prove that their programs are safe in certain ways. Mm -hmm. You know, you could change the liability laws so they have to. But that's what I was saying about it being a first a social problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And second, uh, second attack. Right, 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 right. But you can't, you can't make the laws until, until the technical ability is there to, you know, that what you're requiring is possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay. Anyway. So thanks for your so, yeah, thank you. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.